sometimes in the Christian churchy world, um, people just kind of expect you to know things and just kind of expect you to to be able to figure everything out. You know, it's like they have their own religion, their own their own diction, their own vocabulary, and you just kind of have to figure stuff out. You know, and that's what this class is about. It's really trying to take away that element of um, not discipling someone. Because I mean, think if if you've been saved for a while, think back to when you when you first were saved and just how different it might have seemed. So, um, really, the basis of the entire Bible and even our Christian faith. <coughs> is the promise of God. But once again, this is something that oftentimes is just kind of blown right past. And that's what we're going to talk about in this lesson. Um, so first off, we start in Genesis chapter 3. Now, um, the first couple of chapters deal with the creation um, and everything. Uh, but by chapter 3... Man has sinned and um, are um, taken out of the Garden of Eden. Um, and th this right here is what God says to each of them um, before he takes them out of the garden. And this is what he says to the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put en enmity, <laughs> enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his hill. In this, God is foretelling the coming of Jesus. I know a lot of times, you know, oh, well, how? Once again, because people don't really explain it. The serpent is an imagery for uh, Satan, uh, for the devil. Regardless of whether it was an actual snake or not, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. The point being that it is um, it is a symbol of, of, for for Satan. Okay. Um, as you read through Revelations and whatnot, you'll kind of see repeating repeated themes throughout the Bible. But just bear with me here. Um, it says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. Okay. He, sh he shall bruise your head. Um, once again, talking about an offspring. And who was that offspring? Jesus, who came through the flesh. To set people free. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the next lesson. It's going to be about the law, just kind of making things a little bit easier there. And it's going to talk about the sacrifices. And there's where, it'll, we'll, where we will talk about um, Jesus um, being um, fulfilling that. Uh, Genesis 9.27. <clears throat> so um, people have spread throughout the world... And they're all over the place, and they just become very evil. And um, they just keep always thinking about themselves. Themselves, 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 over and over again. And out of everyone, there is one single person in the entire world who serves God, and his name is Noah. And, and so that takes to Genesis 9.27. Now remember what I said in one of the first lessons. The Bible doesn't answer every question. We don't know when the flood was. And, yeah. So obviously, any any attempt to search for um, for evidence of a flood, you're probably not going to find anything um, because it was probably a lot longer ago than people think. Just throwing that out there. Genesis 9:27 says, um, "Well, let me kind of set it up." Um, Noah and his, and his sons are in the boat, and and the flood has subsided, and so they're getting out of the boat, and. Um, and Noah, Noah gives these, um, I guess you could say blessings to his sons. But look what he says. May God enlarge Japheth, which is one of his sons, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, who is another, who is another one of his sons. Um, but one thing to pay attention with this um, is that it says, and that God dwell in the tents of Shem. I know some translations are different, um, but I think that um, Kaiser, what was his name? I think Walter Kaiser made an excellent point for um, 
it being mistranslated in some translations in his book, uh, The Promised Plan of God. I encourage you to read that if you have any questions about what I'm saying right now. Um, some of your translations, remember, translations aren't precise. It could read either, and may he, he being Japheth, or he, as in he being God, uh, dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, if you read through the rest of Genesis, it clarifies it for us, though, because from Shem comes Israel. And who did God choose to reveal his glory through? Israel. See what I mean? He dwelt, in the, he dwelt with Israel. That's what Exodus tells us when it says the glory of the Lord came down and rested on the tower. Tabernacle. Um, excuse me. Uh, and um, so, with that being said, it clarifies for us later on. Some translations still read "May Japheth dwell in the, in the tents of Shem," which doesn't make as much sense, and it also doesn't isn't really a theme in the rest of Scripture. So, um, possible, but not likely. It seems more likely that what it's saying is, "Let God dwell in the tents of Shem," and from Shem comes Israel. And so what he's saying there is, I will um, reveal myself for people to be saved. Once again, he's giving a promise. See, Jesus was in the works all along. Um, and so he's giving these promises to show, yes, I am still with you. I have a plan. Just wait on me. I've got a plan. Um, so then we get down to 12. And instead of giving kind of more vagueish promises through to Adam and Eve, you know, to, um, to Noah's son, uh, now we have a, something a little bit more concrete, and that's in chapter 12. Um, Abram comes on the scene, um, who will later be called Abraham. And this is what God says to him. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So that you will be a blessing. Now listen to this. I will bless those who bless you, and in him who dishonors you I will curse, and in all the families of the earth, um, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, how would all the families of the earth be blessed? Through the inclusion into God's people by the name of Jesus. See, once we're saved, we are sons of Abraham in the promise. See what I mean? Um, which the New Testament talks about. Um, so I'm not really going to in this lesson. Uh, um, just my point being there, he, he's already talking about how God's going to bring blessings through, through, through that descendant, and he's going to um, cause all these different families to be blessed through it. So then we hop down to 15, 17, and um, God tells him that he's going to be with him, that he's going to give him this land, that he's going to increase his descendants and all this stuff. And then um, uh, he makes this... Um, Packed with with Abraham, it says, "When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, which is a symbol of God, uh, passed between these pieces." Now, the pieces that he's talking about is there was a there was a um, sacrifice done where I'm, I'm sorry, a ritual done where they would um, cut the animals in half and the two parties would walk through. But with it, and that would be a sign that if I don't if I don't if I don't follow my promise, may it be done to me as it was done to these animals. But in this, God is the only one who walks through the, um, through, the, through the animals, through the dead animals. He's the only one who passes through the midst of them. Abraham never does. And that's significant because the promise of Jesus coming was never based on mankind's perfection or mankind's ability. It was based on the fact that God swore by himself, not by what Abraham would do. He swore by himself. And that's extremely important to realize. God swore by himself that he would save people, regardless of whether or not they deserved it, and regardless of, uh, 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 or not of whether um, they did everything right. This was God's plan from the beginning, and, and he, he made a way out. Um, yeah, so Abraham never walks through, but, but, but God does. Um, and you can read that through for yourself in, in chapter 15. If, I'm not, if I didn't make that clear, just let me know, and I'll, and I'll explain it in a comment. Um, so we see from all this that God plans salvation from the from from before the world was even made. Remember, God knows everything that will happen, and He knew that man would sin, but He but He and He already had He already knew how He would save them. And so as it happened, as soon as it happened, He gave them the hope of the, the hope and a promise. And that promise was that the the descendant Jesus would conquer the. Uh, 
would bruise the serpent's head. So, um, <clears throat> so God planned it from the very beginning and told told uh, Adam and Eve of the hope as soon as it became an issue. Um, and what we see in the Old Testament is people have the assumption that the works created faith or that they um, they saved people. But that's not true. The same as in modern days, um, works don't save people. Works are rather an offshoot of faith. That's kind of what James talks about um, when he says, in the, in the book of James there in the New Testament, he says, um, faith without works is dead. And he's talking about the importance of works. What he's talking about is if somebody truly believes in God, works will follow eventually. People will change as they seek after God. It's just a natural process. Sometimes it's a slow change. Sometimes um, we don't see the change ourselves. You know, sometimes we get short-tempered, that kind of different stuff. But as we see God, he's faithful and just, and he doesn't leave us. So works come from faith. They never, ever, ever came from this, uh, uh, faith or salvation never came from the from the law. Now, we'll talk about that in the next lesson. But for now, it's important to realize that all these different things are about God's promise. Now he promises to Abram, Abram, if you do this, I will, I will bless you. Um, but Abraham messed up quite a few times, and God was able to salvage it. See what I mean? Um, Abraham probably shouldn't have married Hagar. He probably should have waited on God, and he didn't. Um, so he marries his his wife's um, servant, and has a son through him, through her. I mean, and God says, no, that's not the son of promise that I that I told you. It's going to come through your actual wife. And, well, you can read it through in Genesis yourself, but the moral of the story being um, that man's inability never dictated God's, God's promises. Right, so then Genesis 49, 8, verse 8, chapter 49, verse 8. Judah, your brother, shall praise you. I'm sorry, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. And then hop down to verse 9 says, I'm sorry. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouches a lion and a lioness. Who dares rouse him? And then in verse 10 is the one I meant to read. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So here we have again a promise of Jesus. Who did Jesus come through? The tribe of Judah. Well, here we have in Genesis chapter 49, um, Jacob telling his son Judah, The Redeemer is going to come through you. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. It will not. And it, again, it, it talks about this later, that it's going to be a perpetual thing. And then it comes through, uh, through the line of David, um, the, uh, King David, um, and it, it stays in that tribe of Judah exactly, uh, exactly as God said all, all along. Um, yeah. And then in Exodus chapter 19, I'm hoping you're seeing the way that the way that the whole Bible, our whole belief, is based on this promise from God, not on not on being perfect, not on all that nonsense. It's based on the promises of God, and that He's He's guaranteed His promises throughout Scripture. Uh, Exodus 19 verses 5 through 6 says, "Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my co my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall." Uh, be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So it's important to note that when God says stuff like this in the Old Testament, the if is more like the result will be. Um, uh, so let me kind of clarify. Now, therefore, if if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, the, 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 uh, the effects will be or the result of you doing that will be um, that you will be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Um, and uh, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As a point, as a, a, to prove my point, what I'm saying with this, did Israel, did Israel keep seeking after the Lord and keep doing what was right? No, no, they did not. They started messing up. <coughs> they started messing up before they ever got to the promised land. 
And they kept doing it from generation to generation until finally God had to, if you remember last lesson, God had to bring Assyria by to punish them and then again Babylon by to punish them. Um, and then again, Alexander the Great. And then, you see, I mean, all these, throughout history, all these different things where God was 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 um, was trying to get them to turn from their sins. All because they wouldn't seek after him, they lost the blessings. But did God ever give up on them? No. Jesus still came through the line of Judah, and Jesus still came, even though Israel had messed up. See, that's what we learn from this, is that man will always mess up, but God will, God is the one that we place our trust in. We don't place it in a church, in a denomination, in a club, in anything, in your own goodness, in your own evil. It doesn't matter. It's about God's promises. We seek him. He is faithful and just. He does not abandon us. Um, so the result would be that they would be blessed, not that, um, that it would lead to their salvation. Salvation is from trust, trusting in God. It has always been from trusting in God. People always misunderstood that, though. And we'll talk about next lesson um, what Paul says about the law um, and how people trusted in it rather than in God. Um, so then 2 Samuel, um, we see a little bit of an addition. Whereas everything, our hope in Jesus' coming was based on not the law, but it was based on God's promise. So then the law was given, the law being Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that was given to help people until Christ would come. But then God gave something else, the kingdom. He gave, it, uh, he gave a perpetual kingdom to David, which is now established uh, through Jesus and will be fully established when he returns. Um, 2 Samuel 7 12 through 16 says this. Um, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come from your body. Um, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Whereas Solomon built a physical house, Jesus built an eternal spiritual house that we can all uh, enter into the kingdom of God through. Um, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, how is that possible since Solomon died? Well, because Jesus' kingdom is established forever. I will be to him a father. Uh, remember, the father is called the father and Jesus is called the son. Uh, because Jesus came in the flesh. So therefore, he was born of a virgin Mary. Therefore, he was fully man. Um, however, he was still fully God. Um, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him. See, now he's talking about Solomon again. With the rod of men uh, with stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I had put away from before you. Now he's talking about both of them, Solomon and Jesus. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. That's once again talking about Jesus. Your throne shall be established forever. Once again talking about Jesus. So we have the promise enriched, first by the law, but now we have it enriched by the kingdom. However, the promise is still there. See, the promise never went away. God did these different things attaching it to the, to, the, to the promise. The law was attached to the promise. But the Pharisees in the, in the New Testament thought that God, it was all based on the law. But it wasn't based on the law because the law only shows people the wicked that they are unable to save themselves from. Rather, it's based on the promise. We are saved because of God's promise, which then the law was given, which then the kingdom was given, which then Jesus came to fulfill the promise as the law also foretold. So, um, Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, and I'm trying not to make this last too long. Isaiah chapter 11. Verses 1 through 2. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. The son of Jesse is David, King David. That's that's the same King David, excuse me, from 1 Samuel. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Once again, talking about, uh, talking about uh, Jesus' uh, coming reign. Now, there's two, two comings that, that the prophets talk about. His, uh, reign, his coming when he would come and set people free, and his coming when, at, the end of, at the end of days when he will set everything uh, as it should be. Uh, Matthew 1.21 <clears throat> says... 
Um, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So, and then Acts 2.21 this is this is just the the promise throughout the history here. Acts two twenty one says this, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, God never intended for Jews to be the only way through salvation. He intended Himself to be through salvation. The Jews just thought that it was all about them. See what I mean? Just because God meant to use them as a vessel doesn't mean that that was the only people that He ever intended to save. God loves all people. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, Galatians 3.16. Oh, excuse me. Now the promises were made to Abraham, as we just read, and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Now he's talking about, uh, in Genesis, I didn't read this verse, but he's, he's talking about, um, a promise that was given to Abraham, um, about how God would bless people through his offspring. And um, that's what Paul is talking about here. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Um, so once again, talking about the way that the promise was was the basis of salvation. St. Peter 3, 9, which I think really puts a nice bow on this whole thing. Um, on this whole topic, Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach uh, um, uh, repentance. Yeah. So that's God's um, plan. I know I rushed through it, and it's very. I'm trying to make it easier to understand, so I made it very compact. There's a lot more that could be said. Um, so how do we relate to Israel? Oftentimes people get a little bit confused. If salvation wasn't through the war, through the law, nor was it intended only for Israel, how how do we relate to Israel? Did we take their place or what? So first off, God's promise did not fail because of Israel's failure. I already mentioned this. It was God's promise of sending Jesus and salvation was based on His promise, not on the works of the law. The, all that God was saying was, if you want to be blessed, you do this. But if you don't want to be blessed, you don't do that. <laughs> Rather, death awaits you. Um, the church does not take Israel's place. And by the way, if you're seeking after God, um, you won't apostatize. You won't. You won't leave. You know what I mean, people get concerned about losing their salvation. If you are actively today um, seeking after God, you don't have to worry about your heart, about going astray. Because God holds you as long as you mess up. I mean, as long as you seek after him. You will mess up, but God holds you in your salvation. The way that you become unsaved is you walk away from God. Purposely, intentfully. Intentionally. Um, the church does not take Israel's place. Now, remember, Gen uh, Romans says that we Gentiles have been grafted into the tree, or into the vine, Um that was the Jews. Okay, that doesn't mean that we took um, that we took their place. Like we are the new Israel. <coughs> okay, but um, also it doesn't mean that um, Israel is cast off forever. Um, Israel was not saved by some other means. They were still saved by um, by seeking after God. The only difference was they were required different things because the Christ had not yet come yet. Um, God's plan of salvation was progressive. He gave it first through his promise, and then he revealed his covenant. Then he revealed his... The covenant was where he had Abraham circumcise um, his son. Okay? That's the covenant. And then he revealed his law in, uh, through Moses from the mountain, and then he revealed the kingdom through David. Okay? Then he revealed the Christ, and with that came the Holy Spirit. Um... But salvation was never meant for Jews only, okay? Rather, uh, one more thing, God will also draw many ethnic Israelites before the end. See, salvation wasn't for ethnic Jews, okay? And we haven't taken over Israel's place, okay? But Israel is not the... Uh, Israelites, Jews, they still have to be saved through 
Jesus Christ the same as everybody else does. Okay, The law was given for a time, and that time it ended once Jesus came. So God will draw many ethnic Israelites before the end. Does that make sense? He, he will draw Israel, ethnic Israelites. Okay, he hasn't given up on them. However, with all that with all that being said, what has happened is we've been grafted into the vine. Okay, Israel is the vine, and we've been grafted in. That means we are God's people. The people from before Jesus, us now, everyone who 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 is a child of God, we're all one, regardless of whether they're ethnic Jews or ethnic Gentiles. It does not matter, and a Gentile is anything that's not a Jew. So, yeah. Um, so there's one people of God, one people of God, and what what the Christians are, what what, what Christians are, are we are um, now a part. We are now a part of Israel. Does that make sense? Um, however, we did not take over Israel's place. There will still be Jews who are saved nowadays, but there will also be uh, many who who God draws in before the end. Um, <clears throat> Um, so God's promises we see are more important than the land. The land that was promised in the Old Testament was only for a for to teach a lesson, and I don't really have time to get into that. But Christians, we inherit the whole earth. There's a new heaven and a new earth that we're going to be a part of. It, it doesn't even matter about the land of Israel. That's going to pass away the same as everything else. God's promises are also more important than the law, because Christ fulfilled the law. And even then, the promises were based before, based off of God's character. The law was given afterwards, after the promise was already given. And also, God's promises are more important than the temple. It doesn't matter if the temple is rebuilt before the end or if it is not rebuilt. It doesn't matter. Because Christians worship in spirit and truth. That's how God desires for people to seek him now in this age, that we worship in spirit and truth. Not in a place, not with certain clothes on, just that we seek him with our whole heart, strength, and mind. And so, so if there are any questions, I hope that there aren't. I hope that I explained them. I really, really do hope that I explained it good enough. But if I did not, please leave comments below, uh, questions, anything, and I will answer them as best as I can. In fact, if I have enough questions, I might even make a video at the end of this class that will answer those questions. So uh, please don't hesitate, and thank you very much for watching.